Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick Emitted a video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. Yep, that's right, I'm not on camera today because of the time that I'm recording, but this will be remedied over the next few days when I'm also going to be looking at improving the audio and all the other bits and pieces that you guys have requested. But do know that I have taken your feedback, mostly under advisement, and I'm glad that you like the new format. As I said, not all videos will be you know, susceptible to this new change simply because of time and all of that stuff. But I do want to put the larger tech news and, you know, analysis in that format, or at least an improved version of that format, because once again, many of you seem to like it. But what about today's topics? Well, we're going to be starting things out with AMD, specifically the future of Radeon and what AMD are planning to release in 2018. This is most likely going to be followed up with an analysis video either tomorrow or the day after. But I did want to report the news first because there is quite a few bombshells here. Then we're going to move over to Intel, specifically news that AMT security on Intel's processors has been cracked in a very alarming way. And it looks like Microsoft are starting to distance themselves from the company, which is not a good look for Intel whatsoever. So we're going to start things out with... AMD and this information is coming to us courtesy of PC Games Hardware so I'll place a link of their video in the description of this video if you do want to see the interview it's about five six minutes with once again AMD's Scott Wasson and it was conducted at CES 2018. So you might recall the official 2018 Vega graphics portfolio, which is a roadmap of sorts that AMD showed off once again at CES. And there were three distinctive product tiers. The first is premium desktop, mobile, and finally machine learning. So in the premium desktop, it was RX Vega 56 and 64. With the premium mobile, there was less information other than just the you know, title of Radeon Vega Mobile. And finally, there was Vega 7NM, which is based on Radeon Instinct, and as the name implies, I'm going to shock you here, it is of course a die shrunk version of the current Vega architecture. But, you'll notice something very, very profound. Well, actually, two things. The first is that this is pretty much a confirmation that there is not going to be Navi released, at least this year, unless something drastically changes or AMD are holding a, you know, joker up its sleeve. And secondly, the fact that 7NM Vega is at least for now anyway, being touted only for machine learning. I'm going to add a massive caveat. A lot of websites are reporting that that's the complete plan, but it doesn't necessarily preclude the fact there's going to be a gaming version. I'm not saying there is, but I'm not saying there isn't, because AMD are obviously being somewhat cagey. So what other details, and this is getting to the interview, did Scott go through? Well, he was as you can imagine, somewhat standoffish when he was asked about the future of a Radeon products. And that's fair enough. You can't ask him to give away secrets, which is you know, understandable. But that really comes down to Navi. He did confirm that this is going to be after Vegas 7M, which, you know, that's fair enough. And that sampling would start later this year. But it looks like the product won't be finished until 2018. Uh, sorry, until the end of 2018. But... We don't know that for certain. Gamers who wish to buy the Radeon 600 series, as you're probably aware, we've got the 500 series, which is essentially a tweaked version of the 400 series. Well, there's a couple of options. The first is that, well, we could see a smaller Vega version, or they could replace the Polaris, which could replace Polaris, or they could possibly release a Polaris, a bigger version of Polaris with GDDR6 or something. But once again, that's not confirmed. And once again, there was one exciting thing that Scott did kind of let slip. And I say let slip in a very loose sense. And that is that when asked about the possibility of a Vega 10 GPU in a notebook, he did hint that AMD's partners might be working on a notebook design. He said, and I quote, I can't pre-announce products for, for, for our partners. It is possible to take a Vega 10 GPU and put it in a notebook, so we'll just have to see, end quote. Now, obviously, if he did say it's possible to take a Vega 10 GPU and put it in a notebook, that'd be one thing, but it was the fact that he said, I can't pre-announce products. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see if a company does announce something. Now, you might say to yourself, you know, five minutes into the video now, but Paul, there's not really that many announcements, and that's kind of my point. 
it looks like AMD are really just trying to get their graphics portfolio back on track and I think they've made a decision and once again I'm going to do a more in-depth analysis on this in the next few days but to me anyway it looks like they're just making a decision that at this point what we need to do is focus on a 7nm process to get that resolved and possibly have higher clock speeds get into the machine learning arena which is obviously very profitable and that might also speak volumes of the design of Navi. Perhaps they feel that getting the 7nm process and then eventually migrating an improved version of that for Navi might stand them in better stead rather than try to release Navi on a 14nm. Another possibility and I'm guessing this I have no evidence of this but it's possible that they also might really need higher uh, bandwidth memory than what HBM2 could even provide and possibly for customer variants of Navi they might also really need GDDR6. In other words one of the reasons AMD might be doing this is they might have decided well you know what this graphics architecture unless we're gonna you know go with very high stacks of HBM which is obviously going to be cost prohibitive it's going to be very, very difficult or very wide memory bus for GDDR5X. And obviously 6 is not, you know, readily available yet. So that might be another reason they've decided to do this. Of course, the logical question is what the hell are NVIDIA going to do? And honestly, no one knows yet. I mean, NVIDIA, there were some rumors that they were going to release uh, Volta at CES or whatever next, you know, GeForce 220 uh, series, excuse me. But obviously that didn't happen. We are waiting for them to. But ultimately, NVIDIA are not really in that much pressure at the moment. And games, honestly, let's face it, how many of you, assuming you're not playing at like a ludicrous resolution, 4K, I assume, is a ludicrous resolution, how many of you are really struggling on a GTX 1070 or a 1080 or a 1080 tie? Not many of you, I imagine. Um, anyway, next piece of news, and that is Intel. A couple of you actually messaged me this piece of news, but I'd like to give credit to Pavan, who emailed us at contact at Red Gaming Tech for the first person to send us this piece of news. So, researchers by the name of F Secure have found a bug, or I guess the best term is a flaw, in the Intel Active Management Technology, also known as AMT. So AMT, in a nutshell, is software that sits atop the Intel Management Engine, and in theory is designed to allow IT administrators to gain out-of-band and remote access to a computer on a specific network. And followers of the IT brigade, uh, sorry, of the uh, security brigade in the IT industry have con been concerned for some time that you might be able to utilize this feature as a back door to essentially gain access to a victim's machine. Imagine that, you know, someone leaves their computer on, particularly unattended. A hacker says, ooh, look, Bob hasn't used his computer for several months and then, or, uh, sorry, several hours. Hey, look, now I can start doing malicious things. So, because this is enabled as default on consumer devices, obviously that has worried privacy activists. And the fact that there is vulnerabilities in AMT isn't new. There are other vulnerabilities found last year, and they would allow ac uh, attackers to, quote, access everything. And this is bad because access everything isn't just like, you know, a notepad file. It means memory and encryption keys. So essentially, if your computer is vulnerable, it is vulnerable. It is as vulnerable as you could possibly be. And to Intel's credit, they did release patches but it was down to the device makers to then send those patches to the customers. And the, diff the difficulty then was the fact that because these devices which were affected dated back to the first Intel Core processors, if a manufacturer did, for example, get a patch that was for a really old CPU, are you really going to release a patch for something that's three, four, five, six, seven years old or whatever? Probably not. And even if you were, is the customer going to be you know, at the point where they even think to patch the system. So, okay, now I'm telling you old news. What about today, in 2018? Well, F-Secure researchers have found another vulnerability in AMT, and this allows anyone to utilize a BitLocker encryption, BIOS password, excuse me, this allows anyone to bypass uh, BitLocker encryption, BIOS password, TPM pin, login credentials, or pretty much anything else in less than one minute. According to the individual who discovered 
the issue over at F Secure. His name is Harry Sintoni. Uh, he said, and I quote, the attack is almost deceptively simple to enact, but has incredibly destructive potential. In practice, it gives a local attacker complete control over an individual's work laptop, despite even the most extensive security measures. And in a nutshell, would allow the attacker to access the uh, MEBX or the Intel Management BIOS extension. And then once they've accessed it, they can then change the MEBX password. And then later on, they can enable the uh, remote access via AMT. And then once they've done that, they can essentially control the machine remotely. So all they need basically is to access your physical machine for a few minutes. And then after that, well, your guess is as good as mine what they can do. And you may say, well, that's not a big deal, surely. I mean, ultimately, the attacker still needs a minute or two to access your system. Yeah, true, but it's not that big of a deal to get hold of someone's PC or laptop for a couple of minutes. You know, that could be you just going for a coffee and then kind of just checking out the corner, you're right? No, the laptop's still there. No, the laptop's still there. It could be in the office, someone you don't like. You know, you've got your laptop, you know, set up in your booth and then... Bob comes along, does what he needs to do, you know, you think, wait, what the hell? My system's rebooted, you don't think anything of it, you swear at yourself a little bit under your breath because you think, oh, Windows probably has just installed an update and restarted without asking me or a machine crashed or whatever. Who cares? I need to get those spreadsheets done. You get the idea. Honestly, I think at this point, there are a couple of options. And this, uh, first of all, F-Secure recommends that you don't leave your laptop unwashed unwatched excuse me in an insecure location so in other words don't leave it on the train while you go to urinate pretty obvious but also it departments themselves should take one of two steps one they set a very strong password for amt or the better option would be of course to completely disable it i'm also going to push this on intel honestly this thing just needs to be disabled they just need to disable it on machines by default and instead it should be an option that you need to enable as a customer as a end user or the it department itself now let's talk about the final piece of intel news and that is a deepening rift with microsoft so obviously intel's woes of security as we all know, really come down to spectre and meltdown when it comes to the popular news. It pretty much made every major news outlet, even the non-tech ones. But the relationship between Intel and Microsoft have just been, they've been synonymous. Like back in the late 90s, the 2000s, you might remember PCs would often say, you know, Windows, um, you know, built with Microsoft Windows in mind. And you'd often see like a Dell computer, for example, especially Dell, that would advertise the fact that it was designed, of course, the hardware was designed with Microsoft Windows and built around the, the Pentium 2 or the Pentium 3 or the Pentium 4 chip. The two essentially just were symbiotic, which made a lot of sense. And many would dub them Wintel, which was a pretty cool <laughs> marketing term between the two, I suppose. But over the past couple of weeks... We've definitely noticed that the vulnerabilities of Intel's processors have put a strain on their relationship. And actually, to be fair, if you think about it, even before this stuff was announced, you might recall the emulation of ARM CPUs of x86 instructions. So essentially, that means you can, of course, run um, Windows and x86 applications on an ARM CPU. So there is an article that is currently doing the rounds on Bloomberg and is picking up quite a bit of traction, as these things tend to do. And it essentially says that Intel's response to the meltdown fiasco is deepening the rift between themselves and Microsoft. And according to one analyst who is working at the Forrester Research, Intel's public face on this hasn't been fantastic. It's a lack of humility. It doesn't give the impression that they understand the issues that their customers are dealing with. Bear in mind that in server markets, which essentially Intel have a large monopoly over at the moment, or laptops or anything else, Intel like, oh, don't worry, it's only slowing your computer down if you've got Skylight by 5 or 10%. The problem is, though, that... Imagine if I was to come into your 
you know, into your house and I was to, you know, take out your CPU and I was to put in the CPU that was like 10 or 15% slower and say, don't worry, it's it's fine. It's only a little slower. You'd say, what the hell? And you'd hit me with a baseball bat. And quite bloody rightly so. I'm essentially taking away, uh, away excuse me, performance that you've paid for. Now, to Intel's credit, I will say that AMD have also had issues, like a recent patch with AMD have caused, this is once again on that meltdown and uh, Spectre fiasco, has caused some systems to be unbootable. Microsoft have said it's not our fault. Some of the you know stuff that you've put out, some of the uh, specifications and so on, doesn't conform to what you said, and it, it's just a bit of a mess. So obviously that, you know, they're bad. But with Intel, it's made considerably worse, because it's not just... Us as you know, retail customers are getting affected. Some servers now are being drastically affected, and you know, five, ten percent on those, especially with operations which are high I/O. It's not good. Essentially, what Intel are saying is, well, everyone's got these problems. Don't worry about it. We'll we'll fix it. It's it's just not a good look. And we all know that originally Intel said that the vulnerability patching would not really result in any performance, and thus. When further investigations have you know been released and now we're actually finding in the real world performance is definitely being affected, it doesn't look good. In fact, Microsoft then released a statement, and I covered this, I think it was yesterday, that there were significant slowdowns on some machines. And this is particularly pervasive on some CPUs, which are, well, any CPU essentially that's older than Skylink. So for example, if you've got your Haswell CPU, your 4790K or whatever, you are definitely going to notice the impact considerably worse. And the worst combination is, as you'd expect, Windows uh, version older than 10 plus an older CPU. So if you are that stickler of Windows 7 who's been holding out and you've been running a 4790K because it's quite overclocked, well, by golly gosh, you're just going to get hit over the head with two hammers. So in PR speak, sometimes you can... Say you're distancing yourself with someone, but not actually use the words. And there's a statement here that Microsoft have released, and I find it rather interesting. Lengthy and extensive partnerships with Intel continue to be an important one. Together with our partners, including Intel and others, we believe in a thriving modern technology ecosystem that is secure and empowers people to be more creative and productive. The key word here, of course, is others. And it's worth noting um, this is, once again, from another analyst. He's from Gartner, Inc., and this is his name is Joseph Unsworth. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Intel's levels of response will be very critical to determine what their reaction is. The wrong way to go about it would be to be reactive and not react, not actively t taking customer satisfaction into account. And that, my friends, is really where it comes down to. The problem is Intel have tried to palm off the issues to others and I've actually got quite a lot of emails from people obviously I can't reveal some of these because they've said to me well I don't want to you know disclose where I work or whatever so I'd never if a viewer sends something to me in privilege I'm not going to you know blast it on screen because that's uncool but you know some people have emailed me some people you know I, I, I know a couple of people who work at different server companies or an IT company and they can't release any information because they're under NDA, so I'd never say anything. But let's just say that they're not happy. And let's face it, if you know people in the industry, you could probably vouch for this as well. The fact is that Intel also upset many people in the industry by saying that many vendors were affected, and uh, including different operating systems. And this would, of course, include advanced micro devices, ARM, and others. And it, it, it just wasn't cool. Now, I'm not saying that Intel are the devil, because I, I've white knighted for them. I guess some people would call it white knighted in a way. Personally, I would just say that I've been mutual, but some people have said I've white knighted when I said that, you know, I didn't really criticize their marketing decisions too much in the past. They basically leveraged the IPs they had, and that upset some people. But my personal opinion is this is really bad. I think Intel should have just put their hands up and gone for it and just said, you know, we screwed the pooch. We're really sorry. We're endeavouring to fix this uh, and we'll work with customers, uh, you know, to minimise the impact. And uh, in the case of Microsoft, in the case of Google, in the case of Amazon, especially Microsoft, Microsoft doesn't just have its own uh, reputation to worry about when it comes to, let's say, Windows, right? So 
it's obviously not happy that your that you know customers are probably buying for their blood when they've got these issues. But now, imagine that you're, um, for example, renting a, I don't know, a virtual machine from them. And now your performance goes down. That means their costs are going up a little bit. And you may say, well, it's only costing a few pence more from this company or from Microsoft an hour. That's nice. And it might only seem a couple of, you know, pence or cents or whatever. But that starts to mount up. And it also really upsets the company. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.